Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to give folks just a second to come on. Uh, but welcome to today's session, Care Where It's Needed, Where We Need It. If you are a fan of integration, bringing mental health to the places that people are, where they show up, places like primary care, then today is the session from you for you. Uh, my name is Dr. Ben Miller. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Wellbeing Trust. We're a national foundation that focused on advancing the mental, social, spiritual health of the nation. And it's been my great honor to get to moderate and lead these up alongside my colleagues at the Kennedy Forum, Inseparable, the American Psychological Association, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, and the Education Developmental Center. So welcome to the fourth of the five sessions that we've done on mental health policy. If you're new to the series, you may not recall that we've you know, done a few of these now. And the first one actually kicked it off that formed this and framed this up. And this was done by the NIMH director, Dr. Josh Corden, uh, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, and the director of the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, Colleen Carr. They talked about how to lay the groundwork for our country to embrace a more comprehensive response to mental health and suicide prevention. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that work and unfamiliar with the six priorities, you can go to nationalmentalhealthresponse.org and learn a little bit about those. Today's topic is directly building off of one of those. And before I offer some intro remarks, uh, let me tell you who we have on the call with us today because we do have an all-star cast. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Anita Burgos, who is a senior policy an um, analyst for BPC Bipartisan Policy Center. Sorry, I'll avoid my acronyms here. Uh, before joining BPC, um, Anita worked on healthcare policy for U.S. Senator Tina Smith uh, as an American Association for Advancement of Science fellow. During her time with Senator Smith, um, Anita focused on drug pricing reform, increasing insulin access and affordability, uh, reducing healthcare cost and rural health. Anita will be talking with us today about an amazing report on policy recommendations specifically around integrating mental health and primary care that was put out just a couple of weeks ago from the Bipartisan Policy Center. So Anita, thank you for being here. Uh, following Anita, we will have Dr. Henry Harbin, who has been a psychiatrist for over 40 years of experience with, in the mental health field. He's held a number of senior positions in both public and private healthcare organizations. And if I were to read to you all Henry's bio, it would take up the entire webinar. So let me just offer one leadership position that he's currently in that pertains to what he's going to be discussing today. Uh, he's an advisor to the National Action Alliance for Healthcare Purchase Coalitions and the Bowman Family Foundation, as well as the Path Forward for Mental Health and Substance Use Coalition. Um, he's, put, he's going to talk a little bit about some of the um, series of recommendations that the Path Forward has put forward on integration. And to close this out, we have Dr. Perinda Khatri, who is one of the brightest shining stars that I know in the universe. She has served as Cherokee's Chief Clinical Officer since 2014, and prior to that was the Director of Integrated Care at Cherokee. Uh, Dr. Khatri became the Director of Psychology Internship Training in 2002 and continues in that capacity to this day. Cherokee Health Systems is one of the nation's exemplars in integrating mental health and primary care, truly. Uh, just personal note here, I brought a group of international mental health leaders from other countries to Knoxville just to spend time with Prenda and her team. So if you're ever in her neck of the woods, you got, definitely got to check them out as I think it will change the way you think about care. Okay, so let's get started. Before I turn it over to Anita, let me just remind us of this moment and what's at stake. Let's go to the first slide, Alicia. Simply put, I don't need to say this to many of you because I think we've reiterated this several times now, there is a major gap between the needs that we have in our communities for mental health and the number of individuals that receive care. So this gap has been around for a long time. We can look back at Institute of Medicine reports describing these gaps. We know they exist. It's the fragmented culture that we live in today. What we're discussing today is really a response to this gap. It's recognizing based on the data that people are more likely to present in places like primary care than they are in other places. And so how do we make sure that we can infuse and integrate mental health into those places that they actually are? Next slide, please. I don't need to remind any of you that it, this is a quite a propitious moment to be talking about mental health. It's quite a propitious moment to be talking about integration and solutions for mental health because the last year plus with COVID-19, this pandemic has created new, almost inconceivable heights of trauma, grief, stress, isolation for many Americans. Uh, in fact, just yesterday, the Kaiser Family Foundation put out another one of their updated polls on the mental health of the country and how we're doing managing our stress, our anxiety. And you can find that over the last year plus, we've hovered about half the country experiencing negative symptoms associated with COVID related to their mental health. 
it's been a spark that I hope has ignited a lot of folks' interest in why we should be paying more attention to mental health. Next slide, please. Because if we just take a second and take a step back from COVID and we look at our history, people have been calling out for help for a long time. Yet treatment for mental health services has not necessarily been able to meet the demand and it hasn't been able to meet people where they're at. And if you look at the data in reality, like about one in 10 people with substance use disorder receive the recommended treatments. And according to, again, Kaiser Family Foundation, close to 40% of American adults have delayed accessing healthcare because of concerns about cost. Four in 10 of these same adults with insurance say they have trouble affording their deductible. So we have a substantial amount of barriers that still exist in this country. And that's why there's power about today's webinar, about today's session, because it actually brings mental health to where people are. And we know that primary care is central to our redesign. It's first, foremost, and fundamental. Next slide, please. If you want to get a little bit of the background, you can go to the National Response website and you can take a look at this. This is the priority area we're gonna be talking about today. And we did this intentionally where you're gonna hear some wonderful policy recommendations, the power of what happens when our Congress can get behind integration and really push forward policies that support it. You're gonna hear what this looks like on the ground. You're gonna see what it looks like when coalitions come together in service to advancing integration. And then finally, you're gonna actually get to see what it looks like as an exemplar looks at the way that we can address mental health with closing it out with um, Ms. Perenda. So I will get out of the way here and turn it over to Anita. And I want to thank you all again, just as a quick reminder, we are recording this. This will be posted on the YouTube page afterward and give us about 48 hours to turn that around. Uh, if you want to see the slides, we can make those available as well with the author's permission. Uh, we have one more webinar, which will be coming up next week on April 23rd. It'll be between 12 and 1 Eastern Standard Time. And it'll really focus on community and prevention and how, to, how do we stop crises before they actually start. So with that, I will turn it over to Anita and thank you again for joining us. Great. Um, thank you for having me here today. Thanks to the National Action Alliance and Wellbeing Trust and all the other partners that have put together this seminar today. Um, I'm really excited about to talk about this work that the Bipartisan Policy Center has done around integrated care. Next slide. And so Ben already laid this out really well, so I won't, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but there is, even before the pandemic, there was increasing need for mental health and substance use disorder care. And now with the pandemic, just to highlight a couple of statistics, there, have, there, have been an, there has been an increase in the rates of mental illness and substance use since the start of the pandemic. So symptoms of anxiety and depression in adults have nearly quadrupled. More than one in 10 adults has started or increased substance use during the pandemic. And we've been hearing time and time again of these rising drug overdose deaths that have really uh, been shattering records. And finally, 25% of young adults have seriously considered suicide uh, in this past year. And so the challenge is that our, our healthcare system is really not equipped to handle our behavioral health needs. So this, this includes needs that were, in, were already there before the pandemic and needs that have increased as a result of the pandemic. So over 55% of adults with, a ment with mental illness went untreated in 2020. Nearly 60% of youth with major depression went untreated in 2020. And as Ben mentioned earlier, only um, nearly 90% of folks who have substance use disorder go untreated. And so these numbers are even these numbers when it comes to treatment are even worse for communities of color. So Black, Latino, and Asian American and Pacific Islander communities actually have the lowest rate of mental health treatment in the country. Next slide. So BPC's recommendation to really deal with the increased need of mental health and um, substance use disorder treatment is to expand integrated care. And as I'm going to mention, Ben already mentioned, I'll mention, and others will mention on this panel, the sort of integrated care we're talking about is integrating mental health and substance use disorder care into primary care settings. And so this will really advance primary care providers' ability to screen and screen for and treat mild to moderate behavioral health conditions, which will increase access to, to critical services that, that individuals really need, whether it's receiving them in um, primary care settings or being able to 
get proper warm handoffs and referrals to uh, specialty settings. And so the way that the current system works now is that providers work in silos and patients are underserved. And so there's insufficient capacity and, and training for primary care providers who are already shouldering a lot of, of the burden of having to address mental health and addiction needs in their office because people are already showing up with these, with these conditions. There's also a lack of behavioral health treatment services to refer patients to. So lack of providers who are working in network where primary care providers can, can refer patients to the help that they need. Um, and thirdly, there's in inadequate reimbursement to provide to provide behavioral health care services in the office or coordinate um, behavioral health, coordinate with behavioral health um, providers. And so that's where we are. And so where do we want to be? And so with an integrated care system, you have providers who are linking behavior, primary care and behavioral health services, um, and more patients are receiving treatment. So the way that we, some of the ideas that we have for really getting to this goal are to have new value-based payments to encourage providers to integrate care, having training opportunities, resources for providers to understand how to deliver integrated care. And thirdly, to have more robust behavioral health provider networks to really enhance referral um, and consultation capacity so that behavioral health providers can sort of work in a consultation, uh, through consultations with primary care. And so I'll sort of pause here to say that the research really, um, or the research really show that integrated care works is a cost-effective is a cost-effective method and can also reduce uh, some of the disparities that I was referring to earlier. And I think uh, one thing I'll say is that on a personal note, I am a caregiver for a family member with a mental health condition, and I have seen what care looks like when it is uncoordinated and it leads to unnecessary hospitalizations and sort of trauma for the family. And when care is more coordinated, it really can improve quality of life, not only for the individual, but for their, their caregivers as well. Next slide. And so um, we came up with the, these recommendations that I'm gonna get into uh, with a really stellar uh, task force. So we're really grateful to have, to have worked with them as, as part of the staff. And so our behavioral health integration task force was co-chaired by former member of Congress, Patrick Kennedy, um, former Senator John Sununu, Sheila Burke, who's a BPC fellow, at, and um, Richard Frank, who is a, behavioral health care expert and also an economist at Harvard. And so there were a number of other individuals in, in this task force, including former federal officials, policy experts, and individuals with lived experience. Next slide. And so the report actually had up to 50 recommendations, almost 50 recommendations. And so I will not go through, don't worry, I will not go through all of those today, but I did really wanna highlight 10 key recommendations that I think um, policymakers can start doing right now. And so there are, in case there are sort of state folks on the call, these recommendations are more federally focused, but I think there are sort of ideas here that could be implemented at the state level. And so um, our first set of recommendations really focuses on establishing core minimum standards that are essential for integration. So first of all, we need to define what integration is and really align that definition across federal agencies and establishing what core services are included in integration. So things like um, care management, measurement-based care, um, being able to exchange patient information. So those, those, those sort of things. Um, and once those core service elements are defined and aligned across federal, uh, federal programs, there should be a set of quality standards that reflects those core services to really improve accountability for improving, for integrating care. The second recommendation in this set is to tighten network adequacy rules to ensure that there are enough behavioral health providers to in, in net, within network to really be available for patients who need, who need that care. The next set of recommendations focuses on payment reform. So driving integration in new and existing value-based payment models, because if we want, if we, if we would like primary care providers to take on managing mild to moderate behavioral health conditions, we really need to pay them to do that. And so the way that the sort of the strategy that we took with um, payment reform is to look at the existing models that are already federal programs and seeing what, what levers exist within those programs we could use to advance integration. So we looked at Medicaid managed care, 
Medicare accountable care organizations and Medicare Advantage plans. And those already have the structure in place with financial incentives and accountability. And so we were able to sort of see, we're able to define specific pieces that could be used um, to advance integrated care. The second recommendation in this set is to uh, create a capitated and risk adjusted payment uh, model for primary care providers to both to treat both primary care and behavioral health conditions. So it could be sort of payment that is more flexible and sort of reflects the holistic approach um, that we're describing with integrated care. Next slide. This set of recommendations focused on expanding training and diversifying the workforce for, workforce for integrated care teams. I think we're all aware that there are these huge um, workforce shortages, especially when it comes to mental health and addiction services. And so thinking about integration can also be a way to sort of address some of the workforce shortages. If primary care is doing more, this frees up um, some of the, the, the specialists, the sort of the mental health specialists that um, can, can now be available for, for individuals with more complex needs. And so in this set of recommendations, we include things like creating a nationwide technical assistance program for primary care practices to receive the training necessary to deliver integrated care and participate in value-based payment models. Again, if we want, if primary care, if we're helping primary care handle the behavioral health issues that are already showing up at their door, we need to pay them better. And we also need to provide them with the assistance necessary to, um, to, to provide integrated care. And so the second item, the second recommendation in this section is to expand Medicare coverage to cover additional behavioral health provider types um, to deliver care within integrative care settings. And so we didn't, the task force didn't wanna go as far as, in, as naming individual groups that should be covered by Medicare, but they did want to highlight the, the important role that peer support specialists uh, play. And when it comes to patient, to helping with patient engagement and also diversifying the workforce. And along those lines of diversifying the workforce, we have recommendations to increase the scholarship opportunities and pipeline programs to diversify and broaden the workforce. Finally, in this section, we have a recommendation to increase grant funding for statewide psychiatric consultation services. The primary care can have some of the behavioral health expertise needed to treat some of the mild to moderate conditions that again, might already be showing up at their door. Next slide, please. And so finally, the, the final group of recommendations that I'll talk about is um, really aims to promote the use of electronic health records, telehealth, and other technology to support integrated care. And so the first recommendation in this set is to offer financial incentives for behavioral health clinicians to adopt EHRs and facilitate information exchange between providers, which is a really key part of integration, having providers be able to share information with each other. Secondly, um, we looked at telehealth, which is a really important tool for expanding access. So permanently expanding, or one of our recommendations focuses on permanently expanding Medicare coverage of telehealth services that advance integration, reduce access disparities, and address the digital divide. And this includes things like audio only sessions, which can be very helpful, especially for individuals who don't have smartphones or in areas where um, they, there isn't a lot of broadband. So, uh, and finally, in this, in this section, there is a recommendation to ensure that data collected by behavioral health and other wellness apps are subject to privacy protections under HIPAA. And these, are, these apps have become increasingly popular. And so it's important to ensure that the privacy standards are being met here. And so um, I just quickly went over 10 kind of key recommendations that we think Congress and the, admi the administration should act on right away. Um, and the good thing is that within the recommendations that we have sort of the, out of the almost 50, there are cost savers and cost and costers. So we partnered with um, health management, uh, I think it's health, with HMA to score a lot of our um, proposals. And we were able to see that there were some that were gonna cost a lot of money, some money and some that were not, we're gonna save a lot of money. So um, with that, BPC is always happy to sort of work with anyone who is interested in these recommendations. So encourage you all to, to think about this, to check out the report and to, to get in contact with me and, and our team if you're interested in, in, in um, advancing these forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. And definitely there's a lot to get into there. So we appreciate your very thoughtful overview of those recommendations and- Yes, and of course, thank you. Before I uh, forget, a big thank you to our, to our funders, including Wellbeing Trust, Sunflower Foundation, and Mirror Community Trust. 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Yeah, for those of you that want to get a little bit more into the details on that, uh, I highly encourage you to take a look at the report. There's also on the website, Bipartisan Policy Center, a nice overview of those recommendations and a video for the launch. So I encourage you to check that out. Okay, uh, Henry, we'll turn it over to you next, my friend. All right, thank you, Ben. And thanks for all the people who've been working on this, the Bipartisan Trust, the Wellbeing Trust, uh, the Kennedy Forum and others. Um, the, uh, what I would like to do is talk a little bit about the path forward and its um, recommendations, which many of them overlap with the recent report that Anita was going over and talk specifically about what this initiative is about. So could we go to the next slide? So the path forward is, is um, it's an employer purchaser led coalition uh, that's got a five year implementation plan to try to drive significant reforms in the delivery of mental health and substance abuse care in America. I agree with everything Ben has said and either said about the problem. We have a, a, you know, a massive, a, really a pandemic in mental health and substance abuse now for a decade. And of course has been worsened by the virus pandemic. And so I hope like you, Ben, we will, this will be a light to stir up um, and, and maybe coalesce a, a more substantive effort on, on all parties to try to make some of these changes that we know are important. So why don't you go to the next slide. So this is a, this busy slide is a, is a summary of the partners of the path forward. So um, this group, this uh, initiative was created at, at the end of 2019, just in time to begin, as our, we started COVID hit like, like a lot of initiatives. So the partners of this uh, purchaser coalition are the National Alliance of Healthcare Purchaser Coalition, which represents 45 regional business coalitions around the country. Um, a number of those, eight of those regions are participating in this intensive um, implementation of the path forward uh, priorities and recommendations, but all the rest of them involved also. We were joined also this year by the HR Policy Association and the American Health Policy Institute, which is another very large uh, employer coalition on health. Um, they represent 370 of the Fortune 500 corporate HR uh, directors. So you've got two really leading employer coalitions have come together and said mental health and substance abuse are critical to us. The HR Policy Association group said to their, in a survey of their leading HR directors that mental health was in the top three problems facing employers. And that was not uh, top three within the healthcare system. That was the top three across the board. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association is a partner, as well as the APA Foundation that has a Center for Workplace Mental Health, the Bowman Family Foundation, the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, which is a large mental health policy institute in Texas, but is playing a key role with the path forward and nationally. And we've recently joined uh, forces here with the Jed Foundation, which many of you are aware of. And we've formed a partnership with the National Alliance for Suicide Prevention. I know they're one of the supporters of this. Their uh, document that Ben referenced has recommended and endorsed all of the um, five priorities that the path forward is pushing as a way to address uh, suicide prevention and their recommendations. So um, there are five um, priorities, which I'll talk about four of these in some detail that the path forward has endorsed. Um, the, uh, would you go to the next slide? So the, the path forward is working on a national scale and a regional scale. These uh, eight regional committees that I mentioned, you can see they're spread across the country in large geographic areas. So these are the regional business coalitions that are basically purchaser groups that advise and pick um, health plans. So as most of you know, you know self-insured employers are the customer for the large uh, insurance companies, and they're the ones that can help drive changes along with their third-party administrative partners. So when the path forward started, it, they did a, a um, the National Alliance for Healthcare Personal did a very deep uh, analysis of the large insurers of their areas of behavioral health. And out of that, and found lots of problems of access, efficiency, effectiveness, and out of that developed a, a, a subset of priorities that have now become the major focus of this group. Could you go to the next slide? 
So the top four priorities, and then we have a fifth, which is parity, uh, but these are practice changes that we're talking about here. And I'll talk a little bit more about the parity part of this. So the first priority is to increase access to the full range of mental health and substance abuse specialty services, whether it's office-based psychotherapy to IOP to MAT programs to inpatient residential or specialty programs for the seriously mentally ill. The goal here is to increase access to in-network care. We know from multiple studies that the amount of out-of-network care that's going on, particularly in the commercial world, but also in Medicare and Medicaid, is significant and people either can't afford to go in that can't, can't afford to go out of network the copays are too high or they're dropping out of care altogether the second major priority is the collaborative care model which is sort of the preeminent integrated care model and i'm going to take a talk a little bit more detail about that after this overview um, the third is measure based care measure based care is basically the use of a standardized clinical rating scale and outcomes tool to measure progress in those who treat mental health and substance abuse conditions, whether they be a primary care doctor or a psychiatrist, psychologist. Unfortunately, in the field of behavioral health, it's rare that the clinical status or the changes in clinical status, for better or for worse, are measured in a, with a quantitative standardized tool. And this is completely different from the rest of medicine, where all doctors, whether they're specialists or primary care doctors, when they treat heart disease, cancer, they use a lab test constantly to measure progress and guide treatment. This rarely happens, uh, whether uh, in primary care or in the specialty care system. So a major push for the path forward is to have the adoption and requirement that providers use these tools on a standardized basis. The research on this is massive. There are 51 studies that were, were reviewed and, and showed that the outcomes improved from 20 to 60% in the treatment of mental health and substance abuse problems, just the use of these tools, nothing else. Um, that, that's a pretty big impact. The fourth area is expanding access to telebehavioral health. Well, obviously <laughs> this got dramatically better in COVID. And I think um, the path forward set of recommendations is that we lock in these changes. Sounds very similar what Anita presented for the bipartisan policy recommendations, which is to make sure that you know audio only, video, all of that's fully covered and paid the same as in office care. All right, can we go to the next slide? So we uh, before I get into this, so the path forward is is recommending that parity compliance and, and parity improvements is a key part of this. We, we think it's important, uh, it's, it's the law. Uh, obviously the employers who are pushing these, um, these changes and reforms are the regulated entities by the Department of Labor. So they're in a, in a very good position to help for, uh, to, for the, the stakeholder side to drive full compliance with parity. But parity is not enough. If we're gonna see a real change in the direction of outcomes for mental health and substance abuse in this country, we need to do all of these things listed here. And some of those, some of these are also listed, of course, by the bipartisan policy and other um, groups here. So um, the, the, as a couple of, as a, uh, kind of a summary of why did the path forward pick the particular priorities and action steps that we did. The, the, the assumptions that, that the path forward had and all the partners that participate in the development of this and are moving with it to, to push this, we had the view that basically we are in a crisis right now and have been for about a decade with access and effective treatment, all the stuff that Ben and Anita pointed out. We felt like as this is a crisis, we needed to pick interventions that would make a big difference across the board that were already uh, ready to be implemented, that have been fully validated and already being used and shown effectiveness in practice. That's how we came up with these uh, recommendations. So collaborative care and measurement-based care are two of those areas. So collaborative care in particular, this has been um, a recommendation by major national mental health and substance abuse policy commissions and recommendations for two decades, starting with the 1999 um, Surgeon General's report. Um, so the, this is a evidence-based intervention. We have over 80 randomized trials. I know that NIMH people don't like it when I say this, but we, it's almost over-researched, <laughs> but um, we have good evidence and we have lots of practice evidence. These, these um, uh, primary care groups have been implementing in key areas 
uh, uh, these um, changes, these collaborative care mechanisms for over two decades. So we are, we are fortunate that this is the only integration model that has a billing code, which CMS and AMA created in, 19, uh, in 2017, which would allow any uh, provider that in, in the, on the medical side that wants to deliver this care to bill for it. So, the, so, we ha the, the, so our goal in the path forward is to see this model fully disseminated. There are a number of major you know, medical systems that are doing this. We would like to see this everywhere. We think that this is the one intervention that would have the biggest impact on outcomes for people with mental health sons abroad the quickest. Basically, once you've, delivered, once you've set up uh, these programs, which can be done in three to six months, you start seeing an improvement in outcomes almost immediately. And what is it? It's not really a very complicated intervention. It's basically bringing targeted mental health resources into the primary care team. And that includes a care, behavioral health care manager, use of these measurement-based care tools, and a consulting psychiatrist. The consulting psychiatrist is a phone-based uh, or virtual support. It could be a nurse practitioner, it can be a, a physician, anybody who can prescribe medications. Their primary role is to support the primary care team and the care manager on making sure that the psychotropic drugs are being prescribed in the correct way in a best practice. So this is a, a, the code that pays for this, uh, basically it pays for a bundle of services. You could almost look at it as a value-based payment mechanism, but it's not, it doesn't have a financial requirement or, or savings requirement. But this, this service is um, um, got, has been shown to have a, a savings around six to one for every dollar invested. This is one of the few mental health interventions that actually has a long-term randomized samples on, on, on reducing uh, total medical costs. So as you can see, most of what I'm saying here is summarized in this. The, um, the goal of the path forward is to get employers, their TPAs, their third-party administrators and providers to um, adopt this. We're fortunate now that, of course, Medicare already pays for the collaborative care code. Almost all commercial carriers are paying for this and 17 Medicaid agencies are paying for this. So under the assumption that we need to do something immediate, I, I make this kind of analogy. If your house was burning down, you had a fire in the basement, it's getting to the first floor and it was getting ready to go to the third floor, would, and you call the fire department, are you gonna ask the fire department to say, well, I want you to study how to use the hoses or the water pressure or whether you use one hose or two hose, or would you say, get over here and fix this with something you know works? That's the kind of mentality and, and kind of assumptions that came into the path forward set of recommendations and collaborative care being a good example. There, it's, it would be nice to uh, and important in the long run to look at different ways to do integration or to find new value-based payments I think it's very important though that those initiatives don't interfere with the dissemination and adoption of collaborative care. We know it works and it is paid for. So let me go, we go to the next um, slide. So this uh, rather busy slide, um, as I already said to you that we've got a two decade history of key recommendations by every, most, most major uh, policy documents in, in healthcare around the collaborative care model needing to be adopted. And we have a lot of examples of implementation, but it's still not fully implemented. These are just recent articles and policy papers uh, supporting the adoption and dissemination of collaborative care. And also some of the things that Ben and Anita mentioned, the need to get maybe get the federal government a little more involved in the technical assistance. The path forward is is pushing employers, uh, health plans, foundations, providers themselves to all um, help pay for some of the training and technical assistance. But having a, uh, some federal help on this would I think accelerate the, the adoption of this key uh, model. So, you know, and this includes the recent report from the Bipartisan Policy Trust, um, you know, these are all key groups. So the recent RAND report is recommending the expansion of collaborative care. So I think we've got something that's very supported. I think it's really important that um, other models of, of trying to validate and research in other integration methods 
are very important. That's very helpful for the future, but we think it's important that not get in the way of adopting what we know works uh, right away. Okay, next slide. Okay, these are just some of the groups that have been supportive to the path forward in its, uh, in its initiative. Um, we appreciate the support from many of the leading uh, mental health and substance abuse groups, but also the business community. This, to my knowledge, this is the only initiative where the purchasers are in a leading position as, a, as, a co as coalitions to change the mental health and substance abuse outcomes ever in the history of the country that I'm aware of. It's a, it's a private sector, market-driven initiative. Obviously, any help that state governments and federal governments can make to accelerate these changes are great, but this is a different way to bring about change, and we think an important one, and we appreciate all the support that many of the behavioral health leaders and the business leaders have had in these priorities. So that ends my part of this. I'll go back to you, Ben. Thank you so much, Henry. A substantial amount of information there, and as you've already offered up to the folks watching this, please go and check out additional resources here. Read some of the information that Henry's passed on, because similar to Anita, there's just a substantial amount for us to learn from. So we really appreciate your time, Henry. Okay, Perinda, uh, we are gonna let you close it out before we get to Q&A and we've already had a few questions come in. So I will turn it over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Ben. And, and thank you to everyone um, for uh, taking the time to organize this, taking the time to participate in this. Um, so I am a chief clinical officer. We are a uh, federally qualified health center, community mental health center in Tennessee. And uh, I'm here just to speak from the trenches. You know, I'm, I'm here, I'm in a clinic, um, I'm in the middle of seeing patients. And so I'm hoping that what I can do is provide some light um, on real world experience and how we are responding to the mental health and behavioral health issues, period. But certainly uh, with the pandemic, we have had to um, manage just unprecedented increase in demand. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So a little bit about our mission. We, we call ourselves the hybrid safety net. Uh, we are, uh, again, as I said, our, we're a community mental health center, licensed alcohol and drug treatment center, and a federally qualified health center. And so for 40 years, we've been blending behavioral health and primary care. Uh, next slide, please. If you look at our strategic emphases, um, you'll see, and this is the beauty, beautiful Smoky Mountains. I can actually see it looking out my window here from Knoxville. So can you please click through so you can get the list? Certainly uh, blended behavioral health, primary care, we go where the grass is browner, wherever there is need. And that really is what called to us in terms of integrating behavioral health and primary care. We went to rural areas where there, was, uh, there were people with significant mental health problems where no primary care providers would see them. And then we would have primary care where we saw just as much psychopathology and, and frankly, just general behavioral health support. Um, and uh, we recognize a need to develop a different way. Outreach and care coordination and certainly telehealth, that's been a critical part of what we've done. We do quite a bit of training and you know, we've talked quite a bit about value-based contracting and healthcare analytics uh, already. It is, it's been critical for us to get into the space because the regular payment models, as others have noted, don't support this at all. So uh, if, if we you know, uh, got into this for the money, we certainly were barking up the wrong tree. We basically said, this is the right thing to do for our patients. And um, 40 years later, we have found ways of sustaining it. And um, as we are national health quality leader as a federally qualified health center, and we've won multiple clinical quality awards. And so I think that speaks for itself that uh, if we can provide good quality care to our patients um, and work together, we can make this a sustainable and sca scalable model. Next slide, please. A little bit about our provider staff. As you can see, it's a mix. And this is actually in 2020, uh, our pandemic year, where we had to shut down, re-engineer many of our services 
we still were able to see almost 70,000 patients last year. Next slide. A little bit about our footprint. We are in both inner city and rural areas. In fact, I should just uh, highlight Memphis. We have inner city uh, clinics, homeless health centers in Chattanooga, Knoxville, and Memphis. We also have clinics and public housing facilities. We have um, clinics in, the, in rural Appalachia in the mountains where we have patients who live in caves. Uh, and uh, so we, we, you know, I had to get a four wheel drive just to get to, just to get to some of our clinics. And as a migrant health center in some of the, our sites, we certainly have seen uh, just a huge growing need in terms of our uh, ethnic and um, racial, uh, racially diverse population. So we also provide quite a bit of care for our refugees. So the diversity of the patients we see has enriched us, it has taught us, it's been such an honor, and it has been, a, it has really strengthened, frankly, um, our approach to care because it has made us be much more sensitive um, humble regarding applications uh, across different um, cultural uh, frameworks. Next slide, please. Okay, right, now it now it just booped up booped up a little bit of the other counties. Um, Tennessee is not a Medicaid expansion state, so um, I don't know if you have to click again, but we see about thirty percent of our patients are uninsured. Just think about that. One in three people who we see have zero insurance, no coverage, one in three. And as you can imagine, most of them are incredibly, incredibly ill, uh, both physically and psychiatrically. They have nowhere else to go. And so our role in addressing care in the most value, value-based, respectful way is just absolutely essential. And then about 40% is our Medicaid or in Tennessee, we call it 10 care. And then we have a smattering of Medicare and commercial. So I, I show this to, sh to say, we can, you can provide good integrated care, good clinical care, even when a third of your patients are essentially have no money to pay for um, this care. Next slide, please. Um, and I think you have to click through. So a little bit about our model, we call it a behaviorally enhanced healthcare home. We believe strongly in the functions of primary care. And so we want to bring the expertise of behavioral health in the primary care setting. And we do have, you know, a consulting psychiatrist. Every team has also has a behaviorist, either a licensed psychologist and or licensed clinical social worker. What we are addressing is much broader than psychiatric illness. We are addressing um, health behavior change, um, self-management of chronic health problems. Right now, for example, a big part of what we're doing is um, addressing vaccine confidence and hesitancy and, and really increasing knowledge and understanding and, and coping with the pandemic. So, you know, uh, anytime, anytime any provider asks someone to change even one thing, you know, uh, write one, give a one prescription or, you know, you know, take, monitor your blood sugar, you're asking them to change about seven to nine behaviors. And if you look at, look at our country and you look at the adherence rates, the, the rates of self-management of people who do this well, it's not very good. I mean, people struggle. And imagine people who have multiple different medications, multiple different chronic health problems, lifestyle behaviors, trauma, um, you know, years and years of trauma, all of these factors impact their overall health and well-being, healthcare utilization, and frankly, engagement in healthcare. So our model is very much one of a shared patient panel. Um, when we have our provider teams, there's no my patient, your patient, it is our patient. We have integrated healthcare records that it's absolutely critical to have for us shared space and clinical flow. This is a big deal. 
Uh, healthcare real estate is expensive, it's prime, but that's why we don't have cushy offices for our providers. We have really important space for our patient. And as you know, Ben uh, was saying earlier, there's so many divides, rather than having the patient move to provider to provider and office to office and building to building. The, really, we as a team, we organize the, around the patient. The patient shouldn't have to move, right? We organize and say, what does the patient need at that time? And we see coordination and co-management as a shared function. Nobody gets off the hook. If someone's goal is to uh, reduce the number of cigarettes they're smoking, then they are gonna work with the team on it. Everyone on the team will know, here is the plan, here's the value uh, of, of this um, action for this patient. They, wanna, they may wanna go to, their park, go to the park with a grandchild and they can't breathe well enough to do it everyone is gonna be supporting those self-management goals. And so that is, I think, very powerful not to have that fragmentation that everyone on the team knows what are the patient's strengths, what are they value, and then how do we develop a care plan that we can all support. And then we also have the continuum of specialty mental health services. So there will always be a need for uh, specialty psychiatry, psychotherapy, intensive case management, um, for substance use disorders, you know, medication assistant treatment, um, intensive outpatient uh, programs, we have all of that. And our, we think of this as a continuum of care where the patient or any person is not going to be you know, the same year to year. Their needs change the intensity of their symptoms or signs change. So we're not gonna have the same kind of exact duration, intensity, cadence of care. It's going to really be guided by patient preference, patient need. And so for us, the continuum of specialty mental health services are really important to see as precious resources. And so we're not going to keep people who can be managed in primary care in those specialty mental health resources as they're stabilized, they're transitioned back into our behaviorally enhanced healthcare home. Next slide, please. Um, I also want to add cultural considerations, clinical considerations are so important. We see a diverse mix of people in our community, and that means we have to pay attention to cultural, cultural norms Moving targets is, is one where a person will come in and um, they have multiple, multiple comorbid health problems. In our safety net setting, it is rare for someone just to have one problem. I, you know, we, I have a pediatrician, one of our pediatricians that I wish I could just see one ear infection, but it's multiple issues. And how do you have some discipline and focus in making an impact where it um, can have uh, the most value. I think the issues of clinical complexity and dosing are monumental because our resources are so limited. And, you know, Dr. Harbin talked about this, Dr. Miller, other, you'll hear it. We never, we just do not have enough resources. We could triple our resources in behavioral health and it would still not be enough. So we need approaches uh, to dosing of clinical care, models of clinical care that can balance quality and have good quality, but also the resources that we have, because we can always provide platinum level care to a handful of people, but we're, we're about more than that. It is about providing care to every single person who needs it and wants it. And so we have to do that. And that has been our goal. As we, you know, as we say, we go where the grass is browner, people come to us with complex needs. We are not, we don't have unlimited resources. Remember, one in three of our patients are uninsured. So we have had to find a way to sustain and scale while maintaining good quality. And I, you know, will say that we've learned that clinical complexity can mean lots of different things. Um, next slide, please. I bring this up because the issue of social determinants of health 
is, you know, getting, getting large kind of growing recognition. I don't like the word determinant of health. I want to say factors associated with health. But I will just say, if we think that just providing more direct clinical service um, in the exam room or in the clinic is going to have, be the only thing that has an impact on someone's mental health and well-being, I think we're being very narrow-minded, that we have to address these factors, such as housing, the number of people we see. I, I spend one day a week clinically in one of our, in our homeless health center. And I can tell you the impact of, um, on mental health for people living on the street and sleeping under bridges where people are using met methamphetamine on one side, alcohol use on the other. It's not a safe environment. Um, lack of access to education, isolation, um, employment, access to health services, and certainly childhood experiences, all of these things have to be addressed. And I will say that um, it's absolutely critical for any approach in mental health to take this into um, consideration uh, because it's impacting, it's, impact, it's impacting our, the mental health and well-being of our communities. Next slide, please. I think a critical way of doing this has been collaboration and partnerships. For us, this is just um, some of our, uh, we've got uh, one of our uh, Latino promotores, our outreach coordinators who are going to the migrant farms. Outreach, partnership, this is how we're gonna do it. Again, most people live their world outside of an exam room, outside of a clinic, and outside of the 15 minute visit, 45 minute visit. And so we have to go where people are um, showing up. So we partner with schools and we have school-based health centers. We have a team of school-based therapists who go out into some of the most rural communities and rural schools because their parents cannot afford to pull them from school or even take time off work uh, to take them for behavioral health. So, you know, uh, partner partnering as much as possible is gonna be critical. And we have to think about addressing mental health and well-being. Um, in a much broader way, and we need to think about it in a much deeper way as we build an approach and plan together. This is something we have to do as a partnership and a team of organizations, not just one. Next slide, please. Just a, a few notes. One of the things that we have recognized and you know, Dr. Harbin talked about, you have to align you can't have silos and separate programs that are expensive. Um, what we have done is align our model of integration with our payment models, with our goal of access to care and whole person orientation. And that way you really optimize your resources. Next slide. I had to say this, COVID-19, just I, I will say, that um, we experienced just, you know, we always had unrelenting demand. I could not believe we have like 8,000 calls additional a week, a week. People who've lost their jobs, um, lost family members. We've had a patient who lost nine family members to COVID, nine. And people have had no history of mental health issues. But this has been devastating children who are basically lost a year of learning and have been isolated, um, domestic violence that's gone up. So we have recognized that access has to be a priority. If you are in, if you're in pain and suffering, getting an appointment five months from now or three months from now is, my, it is unacceptable, unacceptable. People need care. And so what we had to do was basically adhere to our model, but base, transform how we delivered it. So, we, you know, we implemented so much training, uh, uh, screening and triage. I've got our IT, our IT guys did work basically day and night, setting up virtual access point, laptops, iPads, going out to homeless shelters. We had iPads going to the health department, all kinds, schools everywhere. We, per, we have a mobile clinic and we had our behaviorists uh, primary care providers either in the clinic or beaming in 
via telehealth. And so telemedicine and telehealth became very important part of how we delivered care. Next slide. I just wanted to, to highlight some things. People have talked about policy recommendations. I wanted to just outline for us as an organization that's been doing this for over four decades, what are the things that has, what, have, what has facilitated our sustainability and ability to scale and uh, clinical quality and some of the barriers, just so you're aware, because it's not been easy, it's not easy, um, and it is an ongoing fight. And I think that now, particularly with the pandemic being so disruptive and so, um, so much a call to action in many ways, that we really do need to work together on addressing the barriers and building up our facilitators. Next slide. I always like to, to say this, Remember, don't, don't think of integration as the end, that the goal isn't to integrate. The goal is to have good quality of care, access, equitable care, value in care. So if we are not doing that, then we are really missing the boat. So I just, for us, this is our, this is really our compass, is, is this getting us where we need to go? Next slide. And thank you. So I will um, wrap up and take it to you, Ben. Thanks so much, Brenda. Thank you for the great work you do. And on behalf of all the families that you serve, um, thank you for what you're doing to help. I, I, I know most of us saw the study in JAMA that came out this uh, past week that showed how 40,000 kids in the United States had lost at least one parent to COVID. Uh, the intergenerational trauma and the loss of life, I think we're going to be feeling for some time. And so uh, being on the front lines, doing what you're doing does make a difference. We have time for one question. And I'm going to throw it to all three of you. So if you can come live with me with your cameras, and then I'll let you get back to your your days. Um, we, we had some questions come in that we simply don't have time for around telehealth, around strengthening primary care. I just want to ask, considering our audience, if you could tell members of Congress and their staff one thing to do to support the integration of mental health into primary care, what would that one thing be? And I realize it's unfair to ask all three of you juggernauts like what that one thing is, but based on your experience, I will, um, I will toss it out there to you. And Henry, why don't we start with you since you popped up first on my, my camera? Well, I've, actually, I don't think it's that hard. I, I would specifically say that if you mean what Congress could do or the, the federal government, Ben, yes. uh, it would pass a bill that would um, expand technical assistance and training for primary care doctors to do the collaborative care specifically. That would include requiring, not asking, the EHRs to make sure they add apps for all behavioral health, you know, t uh, you know, uh, testing methods that are common. Some of them are doing it, but they're taking a long time. That then would supplement what everybody, all the other stakeholders are doing and would probably accelerate the adoption of this massively. That right now, just one final comment, we really don't have any one FTE coordinating the implementation of collaborative care nationally. We have a lot of people working on doing it, right? but helping track it, coordinating. That's one of the things the Path Forward would do if we get funding for all of the pieces of it. Anyway, so yeah, that's what I would say. It's really, really wise. Thank you, Henry. Uh, Perindo, I'll go to you next. Yeah, I think that the siloed um, fee-for-service model, siloed of care and requiring piecemeal coding. And so this would really be um, shifting that. And I think it is, that's, that's monumental, but you asked for one thing. But if you, you know, if you want to look at what is make one thing that's making healthcare very expensive, it's our fee-for-service model of care. It pushes churning um, and it does not support team-based care. So anything that will support that and move away from fee-for-service to value-based care, I think is a, a, in the right direction. Thanks, Brenda. Really helpful. And Anita, close us out. What's your one thing? Yeah, I was going to say that as well. So I'm going to build off of uh, what Brenda said. Um, and so payment reform, right? So exactly as, as Brenda was saying, we pay for care in a piecemeal manner, and we really need to be doing it in a value-based manner. And the, the report that just came out a few weeks ago from the Bipartisan Policy Center in, highlights specific changes, make specific recommendations for how you could actually move forward with that. So whether it's capitated payments for primary care providers so that they can have the flexibility um, and the, the resources to actually de uh, deliver care in a more holistic way, 
and also using the existing platforms. We have tons of, of federal platforms with MCOs, ACOs, MA plans. Let's use those existing platforms and the existing levers that they have and really advance integration and people will follow the money. So providers, right? If you're getting paid to do something and it's the best for your patients, of course you're gonna do it. So really it, it comes down to payment reform. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you all so much. And I want to thank Henry Perunda, Anita. Thank you guys for your expertise, your insights today. I'm sure the folks watching, if we were in the room together, they would wave and say thank you as well. Um, just to close us out here, fragmentation is our failure. We've got to fix this. And the, the solution to that is integration, as you've heard. Primary care, where most people go for health care, is one of the most obvious ways that we can begin to address some of the issues around mental health and addiction in our country. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to all our partners for participating. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care.